This episode is brought to you by my good friends at Zaka Life. Zaka Life is a very unique, organic, full-spectrum hemp company that offers exclusive, cannabinoid-rich hemp products. Zaka does not white label, which means that all of their products are formulated in-house and within the Zaka Life team to ensure that they are providing the very highest quality products in the market. We're all starting to hear about the benefits of CBD oil, but really, CBD isolate is actually not the best therapeutic index for the human body. You see, Zaka Life's full-spectrum hemp extract offers the original cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, allowing you to benefit from the full entourage effect that Mother Nature intended. I interviewed Zaka Life's founder, Cole Stegman, back on episode 38. You guys got to check that episode out to hear their full story and the passion and quality that the company is all about. But you can check them out at ZakaLife.com. And if you use promo code MASTERMIND10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off your purchase. Check them out, guys. They've got some great products. I've used them, and I think you will enjoy them too. In about a month or so, I'm going to be sharing a video workshop about the most important things you can do right now to start laying the foundation for your future success. These are based on the lessons I've learned from my mentors, podcast guests, and entrepreneurs that I've studied. It's going to be completely free, but it's only going to be available for a limited amount of time. So to stay in the loop and to get access when it's up, make sure you are a subscriber to my email newsletter. And as bonus, you'll receive my monthly update, Millennial Monthly, as well as any of the other insightful resources that I'm sharing throughout the month. So to subscribe, just head over to millennialmm.com forward slash join, and we'll see you there. That's what it's about. It's about creating a life, not when you, you know, in quotes, retire, a word I don't believe in, but, uh, but right now, this year, this month, this day. And you don't have to be rich to live rich. You don't have to have a lot more money than you do today to have a lot more life than you do today. In fact, what most people who experience a great increase in wealth, uh, in income, do not end up wealthier. You, you tend to think if your income goes up, your riches will go up, your wealth will go up. And typically it's not the case because people bring their bad habits with them. Hello folks, welcome to the show and thank you for tuning in. Today I am excited to invite John David Mann into the mastermind. John David Mann first garnered international recognition as an author with his award-winning parable, The Go-Giver, which was co-authored by Bob Berg, who was also a former guest on this show. And for those of you who may have listened to my previous chat with John back on episode 75, you know that that book holds a special place in my heart. It was one of the first personal development and, and professional books that I read that really stuck me, stuck with me and drew me in and put me on this path to self-development that has led to so many other things, including this very podcast. That book has gone on to sell nearly a million copies, and he's now releasing his new book, The Latte Factor, which is John's 30th book and is actually coming out today, the day that this episode is published. This one was co-authored with legendary finance expert David Bach and is already receiving praise from people like Tony Robbins and Simon Sinek, just to give a little glimpse at the caliber of this book. In addition to his accomplished career as an author, John has also been a concert cellist, award-winning composer, founder of a high school, educator, a publisher, entrepreneur, marketer, and public speaker. So John, welcome back to the show. Pumped to have you here today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Brad. I uh, I always enjoy when you have a new parable coming out and a new book because I seem to take so much from them. And I think the style of writing offers just a really cool insight into these life lessons that you're able to share. And you've written these with a number of different co-authors from a wide range of industries. I mean, entrepreneurs, politicians, world-renowned chefs, personal finance gurus now, <laughs> Navy SEALs. TV stars, I mean, just to name a few, I mean, it's it really goes across the gambit. So 
I'm curious, how do you determine what projects you're going to work on? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it, it, it's, um, I, I say it's a great question. That's not a blithe answer. It really is, in fact, a great question because it's one I ask myself. It has evolved over the years because I've taken in the past projects that if I were offered them today, I, <laughs> I, I might not. I've gotten more discerning in, in my, in my wizened aged years. Um, how I choose a project is, is and by the way, I, I'm saying no a lot more than I was, let's say, 10 years ago when I was hungry and starting out, 12 years ago. Um, I have to fall in love, basically. I mean, there are really two considerations for me in a project. Um, number one, it ha I really have to believe in its, its marketability, just to be practical, pragmatic. I mean, writing is my livelihood as well as my passion. This is how I feed my family. This is how I'm building our retirement. This is like, it's important to me that the thing works financially. So number one, I have to really believe that a given book is going to be marketable and that the platform of the author I'm working with is going to be powerful and productive and effective. And that's impossible to predict with 100% with accuracy. I have written books that I was just sure were going to go to the moon. And, and they, you know, they've got a readership small one that loves it. And I'm happy about that, but it's not at all what I hoped it would be financially. It didn't have, didn't, didn't have the reach or the sales or the market or the audience that, that I hoped that it would. Um, so I, I do my best to, to predict that. And I, I've seen some lovely projects, some wonderful books that I've looked at and thought, you know, I would, I would really enjoy being on that journey, writing that story, working with that person, but I just, I don't see it. I don't see that it's going to find a market. So I got to say no. So that's the first thing. It's got to be marketable. And number two, I've got to fall in love. I've got to be, you know, like I, as you, you mentioned, uh, Navy SEAL, I've worked with Brandon Webb, my Navy SEAL buddy. We've done five books together. Now we're writing a sixth. We're writing a novel together, a psychological thriller. To write five books with a guy, I mean, just to write one book with someone, it is very much like starting a business. With someone. It's like taking on a partner. And as I'm sure you know, and probably everybody listening right now knows, taking on a partner in business is an awful lot like walking down the aisle and saying, I do. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's that kind of commitment. Uh, you, you better know, or at least be pretty sure that you're going to be compatible. If this is going to work. Uh, you might want to live together first, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's like that when you're writing a book. It is a partnership. I've, I've got to, even if I have seem to have nothing in common with this person, like what do I have to have in common with a Navy SEAL sniper, right? It, professionally speaking, nothing. But there's got to be a sink of values, a click of character. There's got to be a, a sense that I, I could love stepping into that person's life and perspective, getting behind their eyeballs and living there for the six months or nine months or 12 months it takes me to write that book. And, and, you know, and maybe more books beyond in the case of Bob Berg or Brandon Webb and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah, that that's, I, I love that answer. And I think that something that really sticks out to me is the fact that looking back, you might not take the same types of projects you took in the beginning yes. today, knowing what you know today and with the experience. Um, but do you feel that those were a necessary part of your journey that not having taken some of those different projects on um, I do. I would do. not have gotten you to where you are today? I, I totally do. Forgive me for jumping in, but I totally do. I agree with you 100%. Uh, there, there, it's like, you know, I, I've also started several businesses and some of those have not worked. And uh, writing a book, launching a book is very much like starting a business in that you know, it's a lot like planting seeds in a field. You, you, you just know going in that some are going to fail. Some are not, are not going to thrive. Some aren't going to sprout. Um, and so I've had books, as I've said, that didn't do nearly what I hoped they would. But it isn't like I regret those because that is the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the enterprise. Um, so I, I saw somebody on Twitter the other day saying, you know, what do you do if you've poured your heart and your soul into, into this novel and you've, and you've, uh, Forget if it was Neil Gaiman or Harry Bingham who replied, but they basically said, "What do you do when you've, you know, you've pitched it to every agent you, you possibly can? You have, every publisher's turned it down. You put your heart and soul in it. You've rewritten it. They still don't like it, and you really believe in it. What do you do?" And the answer was, "Write the next book." 
<laughs> I mean, you, 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 you don't want to go into career as an author with the intention of writing one book. It's just not realistic. It, you know, it, if it works, worked for anybody, then they were the exception to the rule. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I, you mentioned that you had that same mindset um, with business and there were some that didn't work out the way you expected them to and there were some that, that did. Yes. And I think that's an important lesson just for the listeners of this show and for myself because a lot of times, especially when you're starting your first business, you look at that as the end-all, be-all. And if that doesn't succeed, then yes. you know, sh- shit hit the fan and now you're in trouble. But you got it. really, that's not. there, there are going to be other opportunities. You still have the ability to go out and create other excellent businesses, even if that first one's not a home run. So, you know, this might that. sound odd, but to, to put it in this context, but I, I've been married three times. I'm in my third marriage now. And um, I, I have worked hard at living a life of no regrets because I find regret to be such a useless and, and destructive emotional state. Um, my first two marriages just, just blew up. You know, looking back, I so clearly see why they weren't meant to be and why they didn't work and why they blew up. The marriage I'm in right now, I've been in for 20 years. I am deliriously happy. It's just like, oh my God, I can't believe that life can be like this. But I honestly wonder whether or not I really could have, have had the life I have now with, with Anna, with my, my best friend in the world. I wonder if I really could have had that the way it is if I hadn't learned what I'd learned from those first two marriages. So I, there was a lot of suffering involved in those, but I can't honestly say I regret them because they really did bring me to to where I am. Yep, it's all part of the master plan, even though we can't always see what that master plan looks like at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so talking about this this new book, how did you first get connected with David Bach, and where did this idea stem from to write this book? And you know, so many books have come from the seed came through this sort of circuitous route that I could never have planned. Um, I, some books I've written, I have an agent, literary agent, and some books she's just come to me and said, hey, we got this guy, he wants to write, write this book, he needs a writer, can you do it? Blah. It's very straightforward. But at least half the books I've done haven't come that way. They've come through, like I said, some completely unpredictable path, uh, which has told me a lot about the value of just putting out good seeds into the world because you never know. So in this case, how the latte factor happened, you know, the, the go giver, which you mentioned was one of my first books. It was, um, the first book I wrote, I co-wrote with somebody with Bob, and it was the second book that actually got published. And this is back in 2007 when I was nobody beginning of my career. Um, at the time I had worked for years at, doing interviews for magazines and as an editor for magazines. So I had to interview David Bach for this business magazine. And I'd really liked the guy. I knew him as a, by reputation as a personal finance guy. So I figured money, strategy, tactics, you know, very at, uh, black and white, cut and dried, cool as a cucumber. It's like it's dollars and cents and money and strategy. And how exciting can this be? And I interviewed him. And I was amazed. Uh, his philosophy, his approach. He said to me in the interview, he said, uh, John, my view is that everybody on this planet was put here for a unique purpose that only they can fulfill, that we're all here for some reason. And that the tragedy is that most of us aren't fulfilling that, that life because we're spending too much time chasing down a paycheck. We're leasing and loaning our lives rather than owning our lives. And my mission is to help free millions of people up to be able to do what they were put here to do. And I thought, damn, <laughs> that's not just like, okay, interest rates and how savings and, and 401ks. I mean, <laughs> this guy has a, like a life mission that I can totally get behind. So Go Giver comes out. Bob and I are writing to everybody we know to try to get endorsements for the book. And David uh, very graciously agreed to do an endorsement. At the time, David was like Elvis. He was already number one New York Times bestseller, The Automatic Millionaire. He launched live on the Oprah show in, in, the, in January of the, the, the year. It was, uh, you know, he was already a phenom and I was nobody. So I was really gra- uh, grateful that he, he gave us a, a blurb for the book. In fact, we put his blurb in the cover of the first edition. And you won't see it if you look there today, because that was we got a new edition. But back in 2008, when the book came out, David had this amazing quote in the cover 
that I believe was instrumental in helping the book find its legs in the marketplace. So a few months later, he contacted me and said, I've written all these books about finance and people who read them love them, but a lot more people never read them because the majority of people are never going to pick up a nice fat book on personal finance. They just don't read books. I'm watching The Go-Giver and people who don't read books are reading it and they're loving it and they're getting it. I want to do a book like that about my stuff. You want to do it with me? And I was like, hmm, let me check my calendar. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. Um, so that's how it started in 2008. And then the economy collapsed and David got frantically involved in other projects and I got involved with other books and it just never happened. Um, and then finally, one day, a couple of years ago, David was sitting with Paolo Coelho, the author of The Alchemist. Um, I think The Alchemist might be on more people's my favorite book list than any other book on the planet, just about. For sure. And uh, he and uh, the two got together because David had helped Paolo to promote a book in the U.S. And they were they had a long evening of, of eating and talking and, if I understand, a little bit of drinking or maybe more than a little bit. And, <laughs> And at one point, um, you know, David Paolo asked David what he was doing, and he told him that he was doing this and this and this, and he'd always wanted to write this book. But curiously, Brad, I didn't mention this, but originally when David and I started talking, he went to his publisher and said, "Hey, I want to write this parable." And the publisher said, "Ah, no, don't don't even don't even bother. People don't parables don't work." He couldn't get his publisher interested, so he told Paolo, and Paolo said, "David, you have to do this." And here's this interesting principle. Sometimes you hear a truth that you've already heard 25 times before, but because of the person you're hearing it from and the circumstance, for some reason it clicks. You get it. And um, that, by the way, happens in the latte factor. The, the hero of, this, of the book, Zoe, is hearing all these things from her mentor. And, she's, and they're probably things that the readers of the book have also heard. And she's hearing it, she's taking it in, but she's not really getting it. It doesn't really click until somebody very close to her has a conversation that's, that's emotional and meaningful. And she goes, Oh my God, I get this. In any case, David, David clicked and said, crap, I got to write that book. So he contacted me again and said, Hey, it's time. And so we finally did it. <sighs> Took a decade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's an interesting journey. And, and one of the funny things that, I pulled from that as you were talking about how early on he was talking with you about how he believes that everybody has their, their purpose and it's, it's their journey to fill that. And the alchemist is definitely on my list. Uh, like it is of many others is one of those top books. That I just love to reread. Yeah. And that concept is present in that book and they call it your personal legend and living your personal legend. Yes. So it's, it's really fascinating that there's the intersection of really the same idea that you see uh, from David, but then also from Paulo yeah. and they, <laughs> and they run in intersect that, in their past. I love that. I know. It's so cool. I just love that. And you know, I didn't even know the Paolo story until David and I were already knee deep in the process of the book. And, and you know, here's the thing. People ask me about Latte Factor. What, you know, what am I going to learn if I read this book? And obviously I don't want to, I don't want to give it away. So I don't tell people, the, you know, what exactly was in it. And it's not that I'm being coy, but it's that I, people will get it better if they read the story than if you just say, well, here's the principles, one, two, three. Um, but you know, ostensibly, it's a book about how, how this character, Zoe, learns how to stop living paycheck to paycheck and learns how to start to basically fund and finance living her dream life. And, you know, on the, on the salary that she has and in the life that she has. And I tell people, that's what you'll get. This is a book that will, that will show you how to stop living paycheck to paycheck and start living your dreams. But it's, it's not just about the finance. It's really about Zoe not just finding money. It's also about her discovering her life. And like you say, her, her living her legend. Um, it's about it's about the starting place being discovering what's really important, what really matters to your life. And and ha, you know, as David says, what you were put here to do. And using that as the North Star, you know, rather than your current financial state <laughs> being your North Star. So is that what the subtitle of the book refers to then when it, it because the subtitle or, or at least on the cover is why you don't have to be rich to live rich. Is that 
sort of the meaning that that alludes to? Yeah, it is. It, it is that, and it's, you know, there's something that David, I don't know if it says it anywhere on the book, but it says it somewhere in the book. You're richer than you think. There's this idea that you are richer than you think you are. You have more potential than you, than you know that you do. You have more opportunity in front of you than you can, than you see that you do. It's, and it's a question of approach. The, the last line, I'll give away the last line in the book, which is Zoe Daniels was 30 years old today. And as far as she was concerned, she was the richest woman in the world. Um, she's, I don't want to give away, as I said, too much, but she's on the way to greater financial, uh, you know, uh, strength, greater financial wealth, greater, a greater financial position in her life. But she's not Rockefeller. She's not Bill Gates. She's not Jeff Bezos. She's not financially super wealthy today, but she has found a way of creating this life experience that is richer than she could have possibly imagined. And to me, that's like, that's what it's about. It's about creating a life, not when you, you know, in quotes, retire, a word I don't believe in, but, uh, but right now, this year, this month, this day. And so, yeah, it is, it is very much about that. You're, you're richer than anything, and you don't have to be rich to live rich. You don't have to have a lot more money than you do today to have a lot more life than you do today. In fact, what, as Henry describes, the, the mentor Henry describes in the book, most people who experience a great increase in wealth, uh, in income, do not end up wealthier. You, you tend to think if your income goes up, your riches will go up, your wealth will go up. And typically it's not the case because people bring their bad habits with them. Yeah, yeah. Wait, we've seen that time and time again. Oh. And I know that this book dives into the three secrets to financial freedom and people will have to go in and read it and we're not going to give away all, what all those are but can you give any teasers or any actionable takeaways that somebody who just listens to today's podcast and hasn't yet had a chance to to read the book or to order it is there one or two things that people can start to think about now to start changing their habits so that as their income increases they can start amassing wealth or they can start living a quote unquote richer life today? Sure. Um, sure. So let me, let me put a finger on two points. And the first is to take a look at what matters. And, and what I mean by that, and this may apply differently to different listeners at the, in this moment, but what I mean by that is a lot of people have a retirement account, like an IRA or a 401k or whatever. Retirement is, is, is a BS word by and large. Retirement for most people is actually an abstraction that doesn't mean anything. If you're 30 today and, and retirement theoretically is 65, that's 35 years away. That's longer than your entire lifetime to date <laughs> away from now. So, you know, what, what's the point in that? Um, you know, one reason that for decades I never saved a penny, I never really managed my, fi my finances in any forward looking way. What? was that I didn't have a concrete picture of anything worth funding. It's like, so when I say know what matters, what is it you would like to be doing that you're not doing today because of finance, because of funding? Or what is it that if you had access to extra funding, an extra thousand dollars a month or an extra 50 grand in the bank or whatever the number is, what is it that if you had, I don't mean a million dollars, if you had a little extra funding that was uncommitted elsewhere, that what would you do with that? What's important? What is it you'd like to have that you don't have now? And I don't mean something ridiculous, um, like a house 10 times bigger than the one you have now or five Teslas. What is it that realistically you'd like to add into your life that isn't there today that you, in fact, that you would add in your life if the time and the money were available? So that's number one. And just play with that and don't judge it and don't evaluate it and don't second guess. Just play with it. So that's number one. Then the number two is to start looking at your latte factor. And what the latte factor is, David came up with this decades ago as we finally got it into a book. <laughs> but the latte factor is simply this. Um, he's standing with Zoe 
in this shop and she's, they're looking at this photograph that she is in love with, this big photograph on the wall of this scene in Mykonos, a little island of Greece. And by the way, this scene is a scene that I saw when I was a kid that I fell in love with because when I, I visited Mykonos, so this is a little, this is a little piece of my life, uh, and snatched into the book. She's looking at this photograph and she's captivated by it. There's something about it visually that's beautiful, but there's also something underneath it. It represents that she doesn't have her finger on yet that she's in love with, that she wants in her life. And she's telling him, God, I just, I, he says, you know, that's available. It's got a price tag. You could buy it. And she's like, yeah, well, let's forget that. I could, could never afford it. It cost $1,200. That's what it cost. And she's standing there with a latte in her hand in a paper cup looking at this photograph. And Henry says, if you can afford that latte, you can afford that photograph. And she's like, what are you, nuts? And so they, later in the book, they go through it. I'm giving away, giving away stuff in the book, but that's okay. Um, the, let's say the latte costs uh, $350 or something like that. I may have the numbers a little off. He says, five days a week on your way to work, you, buy the, you get this latte. What if you made that at home? And you save that 350, just that 350 a day, and you put it into an account called Zoe's Photograph account. And if you do the math, you work it out, it turns out that the coffee over the course of a year would buy the photograph. So the point isn't to be stingy with yourself. And the point isn't you can't have, you can't buy latte at Starbucks. The point isn't that you can't buy fun things with, for yourself. And it certainly isn't about budgets. In fact, David hates budgets. And it's one of, one of the, uh, there's a chapter in the book that, you know, basically it says, don't budget. Budgets are, are, are like the devil. <laughs> They're awful. <laughs> <laughs> they make sense for a cor corporation, but not for a human. Um, so it isn't about any of those things. The latte factor isn't about being picky or picayune or, or stingy or finicky or budgeting. What it's about is just, is just starting to look honestly at where you're spending money, where you're putting out small amounts here and there, not about your apartment or your car or, or the, the big things you spend money on, but the little things. Where are the things that, that yeah, they're fun. Yeah, you like them. But if you could redirect that same money flow in a different direction would give you vastly more satisfaction. And I'll give you an example. When I started writing the book with David, here I am, I'm already in my 60s. So I, I've been living for decades in a way that I live. Um, at the time, my wife and I were eating out a lot. We were eating out a lot in part because we love to eat. <laughs> we love to talk. We love to spend time together. It was a really fun thing for us to do. And so we were going out yeah, a fair amount, not crazy, but a fair amount. We started taking a look at that, and we hit upon a certain investment that we wanted to make, financial investment, and we said, you know what? If we – three out of four of those going out, we did at home. We just started cooking together, cooking cooking dinner more often, um, and redirecting that money into that investment. Where would it go? And, it, it, you know, we saved – I won't even go into the, the amount of thousands of dollars we saved in the course of a year, not into some abstract retirement account, not into some, like – Savings account that's, that is meaningless, but into a specific investment that, uh, that we have earmarked for this specific outcome. Uh, it was, it was just amazing. I've never, never done it before. I'd never really been able to, uh, to be able to pinpoint that before because I'd never put my finger on what was important that I wanted that I didn't have right now. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think it, I, I love those two points and the latte factor, I think makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you sharing that example, but the, the taking a look at what matters today, I think is a, an interesting exercise as well. We yeah. went through something similar within the mastermind group that I facilitate. And one of our members said, we're just talking about painting the picture for your ideal life. Yes. For him that involved um, traveling with his family and seeing the world. And that's one of the driving motivators behind entrepreneurship and having flexibility. And we started really thinking about it and going deeper into that and realized that with his PTO and by saving money in a certain way, he could start to take these annual trips with his wife and his child and start living that dream. It doesn't have to be necessarily some oh, future reality. Maybe, yes, those trips get more uh, intense and further away and longer over time, but 
there are ways often that we can start to live the things that we dream about. So it just takes a little creativity with how you're going to make that happen. So I I like that you share that. Oh, yes. And that's a great story. And and you'll notice in the, in the story, in the latte factor, and those of you, when you read the book, you'll find, you'll notice that Zoe has this, this certain trip. Well, it's a, it's a trip that she wants to take. Uh, But there are a few that come first and, and the few that come first are less expensive, they cost less, they're more practical. I mean, more practical in the sense that they're easier to accomplish right away. So yeah, sometimes it is a question of steps. It's a question of how can I, well, I want to go to Italy for two weeks, but maybe what I can do is I can go to the coast of Maine for three days with my wife. And that's not Italy for two weeks, but it's a piece of the same experience that's incrementally on that way. It's a question of organizing my finances and my life so that I can do that. Yeah, great, great example. So on this track of having now, this is what, your 30th book? Yeah. I think I read somewhere. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you've had different entrepreneurial ventures throughout your life, um, different investments. You've had several different career tracks in terms of um, playing in, around in these different worlds. If you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice to the... 20 year old version of yourself. Is there something that you would hop in a time machine and, and tell yourself at that stage in the game? Yeah. Yes. Um, I would say that could go back when I was at the age of 20. I could also do this going back a few years to the age of 40 and tell myself that <laughs> then I could even say this 10 years ago. Um, find a great mentor in a specific area that you're pursuing. Um, and use good judgment in finding that mentor and then just listen. Listen. I, you know, I had the arrogance of youth at 20. Um, and the, I like to say that writing takes two traits. It takes to rewrite takes the humility of a, of a Benedictine monk, but to get that first draft down on the page in the first place takes the arrogance of a teenager. And, and I think starting a business is like that. You have to have a certain arrogance almost. You have to have a certain certainty. You have to have a certain ability to shut out the world and not listen to anybody and just follow your own instinct, your own gut, because you know this is your idea. You can't let anybody ruin it or, or, or step on it. But at the same time, you've, you've got to, at the appropriate time, open the flaps and really listen to what the world is telling you because there are people who, who know what you don't. Uh, and who see you in a way you can't see yourself. And it's all about the right person, finding the right mentor. I've got a writing mentor right now I've, I've found after years that uh, is just making an enormous difference in my writing life. And I never had a really good business uh, entrepreneurship mentor. And, you know, if I had, if I had gone looking for one and I'd found one and I'd followed his or her advice, um, you know, it, it, I would have had some different outcomes. So I just think that's so important. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful advice. So I know people are going to be interested in checking out the book and learning more about yourself. Is there anywhere you'd point them online to learn more? Uh, sure. I mean, the book itself is going to be everywhere today. It's, in, you know, from Amazon to, to the corner bookshop. But um, in terms of, it's also on my website. And my website is where you'll find everything about all, all my books. Um, you can not only see every book, but get uh, download sample chapters, read excerpts, read reviews. Um, and also my blog is there, uh, which I haven't written in for a year and a half, but by the time this is airing, I should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's all there at my website, which is just my name, John David Mann, M-A-N-N.com. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for stopping by today, sharing what you've been up to with David. And I'm excited to uh, share this with the world. And hopefully this imp- this book has a, a massive impact like some of your previous ones have had on me in the past. So thanks for being here. All right. Great experience. Thank you so much, Brad. Love it. 